Video games had difficulty projecting their voice as a new form of interactive media in the 90s. From one perspective, games were praised for creating unique and interactive worlds that fully utilized their strengths. On the opposite side of the spectrum, gaming faced heavy opposition from authoritative figures for having supposed negative impressions on children using graphic dispositions of violence. Despite initial pushback, gaming slowly found its voice through creators wanting to tell a story or showcase an idea using interaction as a central premise. Survival horror was a novel genre taking inspiration from horror movies by limiting game mechanics to create situations filled with tension and fear. 1995's Clock Tower became the next unspoken evolution in survival horror using point-and-click mechanics to uncover the secrets of Scissors Men. The slasher-inspired Spawn from Hell was an invulnerable being forcing you to run and hide while discovering what secrets are buried deep within Norway's Barrow's Mansion. Clock Tower's moderate success prompted developer Human Entertainment to release ports on the PlayStation 1 and PC to Japanese players. And that is why we will look at these titles today. You know, quite a bit of people that I've talked to look at a clock tower pretty fondly. The shrieks, the scares, the little jump tears, they're, they're all there in clock tower. Have, they're done naturally and it's done pretty well. But that's why I want to see which port of clock tower works the best because not all of them are the same. Each ones have their strengths and their weaknesses. Even though I'm not covering the Wonderswan version, which is definitively the worst out of all of them and I don't own a copy. That's why I wanted to look into today's port versus port. A video series highlighting the differences and the similarities of the vanilla and port versions of a singular title. Grab your scissors and cut your controller in half. We're gonna look at Clock Tower. Quite surprising to see how these versions function. The Super Nintendo was no slouch in offering some of the greatest games in history. While Clock Tower does not sit with the games of this caliber, it is a recommended SNES title due to its nature of being such a unique and memorable title. Very few horror games allow such a detailed experience of uncovering the environment's history while running from powerful beings having little to defend with. It's just you and your intelligence always fearing that one step to death. The point and click mechanics were an exclusive feature PC games like Phantasmagoria used to check out the environments and speak with characters. The D-pad is used to move the cursor to pick up your scattered items or navigate the main character, Jennifer, through the barrel's mansion. Adding Scissors Man makes navigating this much more difficult because of such an archaic input method translating to a slow and tiresome chore. It is a mechanic that's aged like spilled milk and can be a deterrent for some to play. Looking past the mechanics unveils a delightfully looking game with well-crafted sprites and environments. The sharp sprites and environments aged beautifully, displaying some detailed models and creepy death scenes. Laura's first death still delivers shock whenever I see the scissors emerge from the bathtub. The fog effect will change during each port, so keep your eyes out on how different that experience will be. The meta music takes full advantage of the SSMP chip, delivering some creepy high-pitched shrieks to low percussion instruments, delivering bassy punches. The game's forgiving difficulty is thanks to its ability to autosave after entering each room. Dying in any room in the mansion respawns you to the same spot, having a second chance to rectify your mistake. It is a feature that carries over each subsequent port, so I appreciate that it's not been discarded in any way. A key factor to mention is that each of the three ports is exclusively in Japanese but has fan translation patches that can be easy to install and play either on emulators or optical disk drives. The Japanese text uses a combo of hiragana, katakana, and light kanji, so it's fairly simple to read. Personally, the text speed does make it difficult to take time to digest what I'm reading, so the game is geared more towards intermediate Japanese speakers who can keep up. 
While the archaic control scheme severely hinders the game's experience, for many this is the best and only version of Clock Tower to play. The ports from here out will garner high praise or severe criticism due to altercating fundamental features. That leads us to our next port, the simple and wonderful world of Windows 95. There is something special about a Windows 95 chime, a sound that signifies early internet glory, and the start of a user interface that has been built upon this foundation. And Clock Tower is one of those programs that shows its age. It lacks basic graphical or audio settings that prevent this version from being definitive. For that reason, let us take a first look at the Windows 95 version to showcase these negatives. The game's resolution is doubled at 480p, twice as much as the original 240p. Launching CT32 opens up a windowed mode, but full screen is not enabled. That's right, folks. This port is missing full screen and lacks resolution options. You are stuck at 480p windowed with no options to change them. The resolution doubling causes the sprites to have a smoothed out presentation, ruining the artistic intention. Faces are smoothed out and distorted with out of place text that does not resemble the clock tower branding. The smoothing filter causes background elements like the birdcage or the mirror to be indistinguishable from the environment. This can cause exploration issues when figuring out what is a sprite, what is the background, and what is explorable. If you dive deeper into the game's data files, character portraits and backdrops have the smoothing filter applied by default, which makes sense as to why there is no way to change to a sharper image. The audio settings do bring some intrigue to this version. The game's dot wave sound effects are pre-installed during installation, but include MIDI music. Clock Tower 95's audio is dictated by your computer's sound card, similar to a function for setting up MS-DOS audio. This Dell Dimension build uses the Sound Blaster AW64 CT4250, a significantly weaker Sound Blaster 16. The stripped out features of this AW64 causes the music to lose impact, use fewer instruments, and at a lower quality. Take a listen to how my AW64 sounds in comparison to the SNES version. But what if we had a higher quality sound card with interchangeable emulation wavetables? This is where my Windows 98 build comes in. It uses a Sound Blaster Audigy 2 ZS, containing software to emulate different wavetables. You can emulate OPL2 soundboards or even Roland sound fonts, improving the quality of these tracks. This makes listening to Roland or OPL sound fonts significantly cheaper than owning the authentic chip. To change your MIDI output, enter the multimedia settings under Control Panel, and you can change it to any pre-installed MIDI table. Listening to how the Audigy 2ZS is to the AW64 is a night and day experience. While most of you might not have Windows 95 on hand, it's entirely playable on Windows 10 computers out of the box. This does carry over the same problems that were put in place on Windows 9X. 
you are stuck to a windowed 480p, a smoothed out presentation, and one MIDI wavetable. The default settings are stuck in this position with no way to mod them. This version does bring in a single positive on both eras, being mouse and keyboard controls. The experience of playing Clock Tower on a mouse is the only redeeming quality of this port. There's no need to wait for delayed cursors or fumbling through items in your inventory. This is the best control experience that you can play Clock Tower. It is a shame that extensive obstacles plague this port from being a recommendation. The PlayStation 1 port is a breath of fresh air as opposed to the Windows 95 version. Officially dubbed Clock Tower First Fear, this is an enhanced port of the SNES with a couple of new features, scenes, and artistic changes that may entice. <coughs> the disc boots into a brand new FMV depicting a montage of future events in Clock Tower. The quality improved over a couple of months compared to the Windows version, having higher quality models, better pan shots, and expressive animations. The PS1 Barrel's Mansion boasts a darker palette than its SNES counterpart. The palette has a darker, muted tone compared to the color variation on the SNES. The scene where Anne suffocates shows the background greenery having less color saturation and darker hues. I'm left wondering if it's my capture card, upscaler, or the game itself was at fault, but expect areas of the game to require squinting your eyes to see any detail. The shower scene fog depicts a radically different change from the swaying SNES textures to an overlaid fog filter flickering on two frames. I'll leave the decision up to you whether this is more appealing than the original, but the screen flickering white to emulate lightning is seizure inducing. While seizures do not affect me, it does cause headaches to how quickly the screen flashes. It is significantly improved over the out-of-place Windows 95 dithering fog texture. It uses a combination of lower quality fog texture swaying 5 frames and looping with a flashing white. It is visibly distracting and while I prefer the SNES version over the 3, I wonder which of these 3 looks best to you. First Fear includes new scenes that help flesh out the history of the Barrow's Mansion and gives a deeper understanding of its origins. An example is at the end of Dan Barrow's death, with a body emerging from the human sludge, cementing the bridge between First Fear and its upcoming sequel. Other elements have been added, but I'll leave that discovery for you to explore in First Fear. Human Entertainment took full advantage of the PlayStation 1's 32-bit hardware, adding CD audio quality to its musical tracks. It is a significant improvement over the SNES version and fiddling around with sound cards on the PC, but some may not enjoy these changes. To continue establishing continuity between the Clock Tower universe, Scissors Man Scissors were edited to have the same audio as the PlayStation 1 version. Given that this villain is similar and uses the same murder weapon, it only makes sense to use the same audio pipe. First Fear is a great port of the original, expanding on the ideas of its original premise while adding slightly more features for it to stand on its own. But the question is, what port of Glock Tower is the best for your needs? Let us take a step back and look at a classic port versus port direct comparison to see which version works for you.
I know, I know, there's not a lot to look in Clock Tower, and it's pretty menial compared to other titles, obviously, like Resident Evil, Silent Hill, and obviously, there's a ton that I could really go into, but an evolution is an evolution, and Clock Tower does have that in spades. It's a natural progression of how games like Alone in the Dark, Phantasmagoria have, but it really tries to set itself apart. It's a product of its time, so it's not going to age the best as other games, but I think it's more of a novelty and an appreciation to see more of a game that's this archaic, how it functions, and to appreciate what we have today. And we do owe quite a lot to a clock tower, whether you think so or not. But what do you guys think? Which port of clock tower works for you? That Super Nintendo version is extremely nice and well is the basis of all of them, but the PS1 version has quite a lot of new amenities features that I think people will like to try on like a second playthrough, but let me know what you guys think down below. I want to thank these guys right here who have helped support the channel either through Patreon, YouTube membership, and even for you for watching, for the likes, subscribes, the comments. It really does help me a lot, makes me want to create more of these videos, and hopefully they're to your liking. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it, and I'll see you guys very soon.